candidate who reminds me of the symbol of his party, the circus elephant, his head full of ivory, a long memory and no vision, and you have seen elephants being led around the circus ring. They grab the tail of the elephant in front of them. And the Execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the small undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the word, Ich bin ein Berliner. Take the trip to Texas. There, he had hoped to reconcile differences between two factions of the state's Democratic Party, as well as drum up political support in the state that he had barely carried back in 1960. Kennedy, in fact, had felt the visit to be so crucial to his re-election chances that he persuaded his wife, Jacqueline, to accompany him. My name is William Cooper. Between the years 1970 and 1973, I served on the intelligence briefing team of the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet, who at that time was Admiral Bernard Cleary. I was attached to the Office of Naval Intelligence. I had a top secret, Q, sensitive compartmentalized information, security clearance, and actually had access and the need to know almost everything that the Admiral himself, the members of his staff, and many high-level government officials. It was during this time that during the routine course of my duties, top secret documents crossed my desk that I was able to read that outlined 
everything that really and truthfully happened, according to those documents, in Dallas on November the 22nd, 1963, when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. According to these top secret documents, the intelligence community and the national security apparatus considered John F. Kennedy to be a threat to the national security. It did not explain what this meant. It stated also that he had ordered the security establishment to prepare a plan to reveal to the American people within the following year the truth about unidentified flying objects. It also stated that he had ordered the intelligence community and the CIA specifically to cease importing and selling illegal narcotics drugs to the American people in order to finance their black projects. Now we know that he had ordered also the printing of real money again, silver certificates, backed by real silver money. And we also know that that would have broken the back of the Federal Reserve. He had also threatened publicly to disband the Central Intelligence Agency and scatter it to the thousand winds. We know that he had refused to provide air support for the invasion of the Bay of Pigs. A lot of people were really angry and upset with John F. Kennedy. As stated in those documents, that the assassination pistol used was prepared, manufactured specifically by the Central Intelligence Agency for assassinations. It was electrically operated, gas powered, and could either fire a poison dart, a small hypodermic needle, or an exploding pellet which could contain any one of several deadly poisons. These documents stated that William Greer, the driver of the President's car, a Secret Service agent, an ex-chauffeur of the Lodge family, turned in his seat and fired with this assassination pistol at point-blank range at the President's head, an exploding pellet filled with shellfish toxin, which really killed our President. President Kennedy's brain was missing. Another was substituted in its place, which showed little or no damage at all. Completely opposite of what the doctors at Parkland Hospital described. The documents that I read said that President Kennedy's body was taken out of the casket on the plane and actually arrived at Bethesda Naval Hospital a full 30 minutes before the empty casket that the public television cameras and Mrs. Kennedy accompanied. It stated that when the autopsy was performed they found that the brain had already been severed at the spinal cord and showed little or no damage whatsoever. This has since been conserved, uh, confirmed by independent investigators other than me. But I can prove that as far back as 1972 I told all of these details to several other people, one of whom I have disclosed publicly already. In this film you're going to see, this film narrated by a man named Lars Hansen, uh, the film that he claims that he prepared and discovered, we really haven't gotten to the bottom of that yet, you're going to see this act, but this is a poor film. Watch closely. Keep your eyes on the driver. Remember, if you want to see who murdered a man, don't watch the man being murdered. Look around. In this instance, keep your eyes on the driver. Now, if you don't see it in this section of the film, you're going to see a better film after this at some point. And then, before this video is over, you're going to see the most clear, most beautiful copy of the Zapruder film you've ever seen in your life. And you're going to see, without any doubt, William Greer shoot President Kennedy and kill that man in Dallas.
Nearly 25 years ago, the people of the United States and the world were shattered by the impact of an assassin's bullets upon the helpless, unsuspecting young president of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. The horrendous wound inflicted by those bullets has penetrated deeply into the body and soul of America, destroying the very lives of thousands and the heart and trust and political will of literally millions. And the years that have passed since this tragic event removed from the world stage perhaps one of the most promising human agents of peace and progressive political development, we have been fed one officially sanctioned lie after another, beginning with a blue ribbon cover-up commission to a castrated Senate Select Committee sh seeking to shed light upon an event deliberately enshrouded in deception, concealment, and outright falsehood. Twenty-five years is long enough. It is time the truth was finally told in the earnest hope that it will truly set us free of the murderers who pose as our protectors. What we're observing here is the motorcade in Dallas on November 22, 1963. As the presidential car passes behind the freeway sign, President Kennedy is struck in the throat by a bullet that was fired from the grassy knoll. As he's grasping his throat, John Connolly is turning around to his right. He, at that point, is struck. You notice the driver, or excuse me, the passenger of the car turning back to see what has happened to the president. As he turns back to the front, the driver of the car turns with his left arm over his right shoulder with a pistol and fires. You see the 45 automatic, 45 caliber nickel-plated automatic weapon in his left hand he's firing over his right shoulder you see it in relief you see his head pointing backwards towards the president in this enhanced close-up you see the impact of the bullet upon the president the force of the shot drives him violently backward against the back of the seat you see mrs kennedy react in horror the ugly gaping wound which is evident here according to many observers at the scene was actually created on the print this was not the actual nature of the wound but you notice that mrs kennedy wasted no time in trying to exit the vehicle because she clearly was able to determine exactly where that shot had originated and it was her personal bodyguard clint hill another secret service agent who attempted to keep her in what the arrow is indicating here is what appears to be the outline of a man, a hat, and his rifle. The arrow is pointing to the rifle barrel of the man in the bushes who possibly was the rifleman on the grassy knoll who fired that shot. Another view taken by another photographer. Again, you see Mrs. Kennedy trying to exit the vehicle from behind, being pushed back in by her bodyguard. Number of witnesses on the scene rushing towards the vehicle. This section, the man standing on the far right of the wall there is Abraham Zapruder, the photographer who took the original photos. The arrow here is indicating what was very likely uh, the rifleman on the grassy knoll, the man who fired the shot which penetrated Kennedy's throat from the front, not from behind as the Warren Commission would have you believe. Very interesting note also that the motorcycle policemen were told to remain behind the car at all times. Here you see the passenger in the front turning back, looking at the president. Instead of jumping back to assist him, he turns forward. The driver is now rotating. The weapon comes into view, and he fires. You'll see this repeatedly in these sequences. Kennedy's been shot in the throat. He's leaning to his left. The driver now begins to rotate. His left arm comes over his right shoulder, and he fires now. Again, you see the driver rotate. You see the weapon come into view. He's rotating again. The weapon is in view. He fires. You can clearly see his head turning and the, his arm and the weapon extending into view over his right shoulder. Many of the witnesses indicated that the car slowed almost to a virtual halt at about this point. And here in the normal version, you see how much more quickly it is speeded up. It's much harder to... United States. So help me God. So help me God. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of...
Ms. Joan Kennedy. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States.